Hi, friends. Thank you for joining us for online worship here at Aldersgate in Mechanicsburg. I'm Jan Hughes, lead pastor here, and I am just so glad that you joined us. We are in the middle of our Lenten series called The Great Lenten Experiment, and I hope that you are just learning so much about yourself and others in this experience, and mostly, I hope that you're learning something more about your God. So today, before we start, uh, I just want to remind you that we will be collecting uh, your excess, your small appliances, your clothing, anything as you've gone through your houses and you've realized you don't need it. We are collecting them uh, Thursdays from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, every Thursday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock until the end of March. So bring those boxes and we will get them ready to go to Methodist Mountain Mission in Kentucky. So thank you in advance for that. Now today, we have a special announcement. Today we get to introduce and you get to welcome our new worship director, Jake Bear. We're so blessed that God prepared the way and brought Jake to us. So I just wanna give Jake a moment to meet you and for you to get to uh, know Jake a little bit better. So Jake, a thank you, welcome. And Jake is gonna come and chat with you for just a moment. Thanks, Jen. Hi, Aldersgate. I am Jake, the new uh, director of worship here. Um, I'm very happy to be here and very excited to get started today. Um, I just wanted to take a minute and introduce myself. Um, I graduated from Messiah College in 2017. Um, after college, I moved back to the Williamsport, PA area where I grew up. Um, and there I was the director of worship at First Church in Williamsport. Um, over the last year or so, I uh, made my way back down to uh, this area um, in the last couple, six months or so, uh, got engaged to my fiance. Um, she and I just bought a house and we're, we're very happy to be uh, kind of settling in here and uh, planting some roots. Um, I know for a lot of us, uh, when we talk about worship, the first thing that comes to mind is music. Um, and that is such a powerful way that we can worship. Um, but to me, music um, is, is just one part. Worship goes far beyond just music. Um, and it's, it's simply just a way that we, um, it's an act of turning our hearts and our minds to the Lord um, and recognizing who he is and what he has done for us. Um, and so uh, today we're gonna, we're gonna have a chance to do that. Um, and I'm excited going forward to, uh, to be able to dive into that more deeply together. Um, so today we're, we're going to continue in our, our series. We're going to be talking a little bit about waste. Um, and let's just not waste any time. Let's pray together um, and let's worship today. Lord, I thank you um, for allowing each of us to connect however we're connected, Lord. Lord, I pray that uh, you would meet us wherever we're at um, and that this morning would be, uh, or today would be a time that we can uh, just settle into your presence that you can show us what you need to show us, Lord. And God, ultimately, I just pray um, that you would allow us to worship and grow closer to you, Lord. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Let that be our prayer. That today, tomorrow, and all the days beyond, that we would build our lives firmly on you, firmly on the foundation of your love. Lord, and just let us stand confident in the promise of that firm foundation. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be.
Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. You are breaking. It's an everyday word that we use in our lives. Like we hear and we're told, don't waste water, don't waste your time, don't waste energy, don't waste your money, don't waste your life. And yet, in this country alone, we are the most wasteful people in the world. Americans produce almost five pounds of waste per person per day. The United States represents just 4% of the world's population, but do you know that here in the United States, we produce 12% of global solid waste? Water is one of the things that we all probably waste. It's one of the most precious resources that we have on this earth, though. We have seen and felt the importance of water so clearly, right, as we've watched the news of the devastation to Texas and the lack of clear, clean water available to the folks there. This devastation in Texas reminds me of the many parts of the world that deal with this disaster every single day of their lives. When I went on my first mission trip to Haiti, I was educated to the biggest problem that the people of Haiti had to deal with in order to thrive and even survive. It was the problem 
of muddying the water. You see, as I visited the villages outside of Port-au-Prince, I noticed people gathering at streams. They were doing their laundry. They were washing their children in the stream. And at the same time, chickens and goats were walking through the streams. They were dumping their wastewater into the stream. And it became very clear that was happening, what was happening upstream directly affected the water quality then downstream. There is a consequence when you muddy the water. The problem of waste and muddying the waters may seem that it's just our contemporary problem. It's, it's an issue that we deal with, it, but it actually was an ancient issue that God's people had to come to terms with as well. Don't muddy the waters, and don't muddy the waters of another. This has both practical application, but also it has deep spiritual application for we as the people of God who want to follow the ways of Jesus. So, in ancient times, the people of Israel had turned away from God, and they were wasting their inheritance. They forgot their purpose, and they walked away from the precious relationship that God wanted them to enjoy. God's people were conquered by the Babylonians, and they were taken into exile. Now God raised up Ezekiel, a prophet of God, someone to be the voice of God while they were in exile. God raises up Ezekiel. He's going to help to be the voice of God to, because God wanted to restore God's people to their purpose and their potential as people of God. So the account found in the book of Ezekiel, as you read it, you'll find that it's a rhythm of God's heart, calling God's people to repent and to turn back to God so that they could understand the depth of love that God had for them and the depth of also their spiritual impact on other people as well. This is a powerful teaching. Ezekiel is speaking for the Lord, and he's telling the people that God has pledged God's self to be the one and only true shepherd. God said that he would search out his sheep who were afraid and victimized. God promises to clean up the water for the nation of Israel. God desired to restore his people with a covenant of peace. And God tells Ezekiel this. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety, and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land. No longer will they bear the scorn of the nations. God wanted to provide for God's people, to give them what they desperately needed. And because then they would know that the Lord their God is their one true God, and their Lord their God is with them. There's an ancient and powerful image that God reveals to Ezekiel and to the people in exile. In Ezekiel 34, verse 10, come with me so I can show you. So here we are at a stream. Because in Ezekiel, God is saying to his people, he gives them these promises of what he wants to do for his people. He says this, in the midst of promise and grace and mercy, I will make you and the places surrounding you a blessing. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. The trees will yield their fruit and the ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. All this goodness, all this incredible beauty was probably around God's people back in Ezekiel's time. And so as God's people were looking around, and God says, this is the promise, this is what I give you. Then God asks them this question. He says this, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? 
Must you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet? And then God continues and he asks another question. Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled? Must they drink what you have muddied with your feet? You see, God is saying, don't muddy the water. Don't waste you. Don't waste you. Don't waste what I have given you. You know, this water, this water is a symbol of God's love and God's provision. It's a beautiful sign. And you know what? As I look into the water, I can see the reflection. I can see my shadow. And I'm reminded that I made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. You reflect God's beauty. The waters of our baptism also remind us of this, don't they? It's the baptismal waters that remind us of this beautiful relationship that God has given us through Christ. It's this beautiful relationship that we have. And so God is saying, it's clear water. I've cared for you. I love you. Don't muddy the water. Friend, how do you muddy your water? How do you muddy the water of your life? Can I tell you that when you open up that computer and you watch things that you know are unholy, or when you turn on the TV and, and you're watching something that you know isn't good, it's garbage in, do you know that you're muddying the water of God's love and provision for you? Do you know that when you think about yourself in negative terms, when you say, I'm never good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not, I'm not rich enough, I'm just, I'm not enough. You buddy the waters of that image of God that God has imprinted upon your soul. God has painted on your life. Or, well, when you perhaps harbor resentment and unforgiveness, when you start thinking negative thoughts about others and then it builds and builds until the rage just boils up inside of you and you're just angry and you're angry at life, you're angry at people. You are muddying your water. You're muddying your water. Or perhaps, perhaps you just feel like, well, I don't know what my water means to me. I don't know a relationship with God. And so I don't know how to unmuddy my water. Friend, God is telling you, don't waste you. I love you. I care for you. Don't muddy your water because, see, here's the thing. When we muddy the water, when we muddy our water, I can no longer see the reflection of God in my life. I can no longer enjoy the love that God has for me. You know what? When we muddy the water, anyone downstream, they have to deal with our muddied water. When you muddy your water, it doesn't just affect your life. It affects the life of those around you, those that you love, those that care for you. And so God says, don't muddy your water. God asks God's people, and today God is asking you and me, is it not enough that I give you clear water to drink? Must you muddy the water with the rest of your feet? Just like the people in Haiti realized that was what was happening upstream affected those who lived downstream, we too must acknowledge and come to terms with what we do affects so many others. We are actually part of the butterfly effect. 
You may have heard of this. The butterfly effect is the idea that's more commonly used in chaos theory. The butterfly effect means that a small change can make such a bigger change happen. Like one small incident can have a big impact on the future. So the term butterfly effect means that it comes from an analogy where a butterfly can flap its wings in Tokyo and a tornado occurs in Tennessee. Friend, when you muddy your own water, it's not just you who is affected. Your behavior and your life has a profound effect on someone else's life and their future. So when you're looking at pornography on your computer, your relationship with your spouse is bound to suffer. When you're frustrated at work, and that evening you take it out, you take your frustrations out on your kids or your wife or even your dog, you might not realize it, but you've just muddied the water of the ones that you love. Recently, I read an interaction on Facebook between two of my spiritual mentors. I have a deep respect for these two men. They have both helped me in my early years in ministry. And so as I read their exchange, it wasn't the political content that they were remarking on and disagreeing with. It was how they responded to each other. It was almost as if they forgot who they were. In that post, they forgot the reflection of God's love and purpose in their life and in their lives together, as friends together. They muddied their water. And you know what? They muddied my water as well. When I muddied that water in the stream, those downstream were going to experience the effect of me muddying my water, what I thought my water. It was my water after all. So what can we do? What can you and I do? Well, it might sound pretty simple, right? I mean, I could just say, just stop. Stop muddying the water. But friend, you and I can't stop on our own. If it's left to us, if it's left to me, or just left to you, we are always going to tend to have the opinion, well, it's my water. I mean, what I do with my water, regardless of how good or bad it is for me or for others, it's my water. And maybe during COVID, maybe you've had the thought and you've had the inclination of like, I don't want to muddy my water anymore. I want to clean up my water. And so... Maybe you've tried, but you feel weighed down because to try to stop on your own, like to try to clean up your own water, you just can't do it. You cannot clean up your own act, and either can I. You just can't do it on your own. You need help. You need a Savior. You need a Savior to help you to do the very thing that you might want to do, but you can't do it yourself. And here's the good news. You have that Savior. Jesus died, died on the cross to clean up your stream. You know, in Haiti, there's this beautiful invention called a portable water filtration system. It's amazing. It takes dirty, polluted water, and it goes through this jug, and it has a bunch of filters in that jug, and as it goes through, what comes out in this new place is clean drinking water, purified. Jesus, Jesus is like that filtered purification system. Jesus is the one who takes away our dirty, sinful life. Jesus is the one who died to be able to take your dirty, sinful life and to run it through the blood that Jesus spilled on that cross so that your life and my life would be clean, clean, perfect.
perfect? No, but clean before God. And then, oh, when we surrender to that incredible gift of Jesus on the cross and we become clean, then we don't have to muddy someone else's water. Because what I do, where my feet go, someone else is bound to be affected, going to be affected by how I live my life. God says in Ezekiel, he speaks through Ezekiel and he says, I, God, I am your good shepherd. So tell my people, stop muddying the water. I will be their shepherd, God says. And Jesus is saying to you today, I want to be your shepherd. I want to clean your water. I want to be the restorer of your soul. Friend, you and I can be clean. And we don't have to muddy someone else's water. We just have to give over control and say, God, I can't do this on my own. And so, Jesus, come into my life. Come in, Lord, and clean up my act. Clean up my life. Clean up my water so that, God, I can live for you. I can live for you. I can be redeemed and restored. And then, God, let my feet not muddy someone else's water. It's that easy. Don't make it any harder than it needs to be. Today, I want to give you a spiritual practice that will help you to claim this restoration, this purification of your soul. So that this week, as you move through your house and as you're looking at all the things that perhaps you waste, as you perhaps realize, I'm wasting electricity and I want to turn the light switch off. I'm wasting my natural resources and I want to be mindful. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my energy on things that aren't holy before God. That each time that you're mindful of the waste that you are experiencing, that you could, as the psalmist says this, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So I want to give you an opportunity as we close out this service today. I'm going to ask Jake to come back to you and to allow us to sing, to pray, to let our hearts just reach the very heights of heaven, the very heart of God. As we say, God, we are open to you today. We want you to create a clean heart in us. We ache, oh God. Restore a right spirit in us. Let's continue to worship and to pray.
those words stick with us this week. Let that be our prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this today. We thank you that you do create a clean heart in each of us, Lord. So help us to not be wasteful. Help us to take steps that you call us to, to not be wasteful this week, Lord. Amen. Have a good week. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. This week, the challenge as part of the Great Lenten Experiment is to reduce your waste in whatever way that looks like for you. And as you reduce physical waste in your life this week, we want you to erase the spiritual pollution in your life as well by saying that prayer as you reduce physical waste. So what could this look like? Maybe it looks like you turn off the water when you're washing your hands and you say, create in me a clean heart, O God and restore a right spirit within me. Maybe it looks like that you go to recycle something and you say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. Maybe you use cloth napkins instead of disposable napkins this week and say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. Or maybe you turn off the lights and use less electricity this week. And when you turn off the light switch, you say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. This week, we also have the message exploration documents on our website. So if you go to our website, orderskatechurch.net, click on the Great Lenten Experiment, and you'll see many different ways that you can reduce your physical waste this week. We want to thank you for your continued support of Aldersgate that allows services like this and the message exploration documents and even things like home church to continue here at Aldersgate. And so we're going to close the service today by one of our home churches. They've called themselves the This Is Us Home Church. They're going to talk to you about a partnership we have here at Aldersgate about collecting plastic film recycling and how we can continue to do this as a way to reduce our waste as a church community. So take a look. to It's in the Bag. I'm Debbie Smith, and this is Aldersgate's newest game show. Sponsored by Trex.com for all of your composite decking needs. And AldersgateChurch.net, reaching with the heart of Christ for the lives in our community. Now let's get started, friends. Tonight's contestants are Scott and Jax. Let's begin our trash it or recycle it round. Are you ready? Ready. ready. All right, first question. A recycling symbol with a four in the center can be? Trash. Recycled. Jax, you are correct. And also, if it has a two, you can recycle it also. Do I need to get extra points? No. Jax, you now have 10 points. Next question. A cereal box liner can be trashed recycled. because it crinkles like Captain Crunch. Recycled, and it also can be recycled because it stretches. Now do I get extra points? No. Jax, you now have 20 points. Next question. The plastic film around bulk items such as toilet paper, tissues, and paper towels. Trash it. Recycled. Extra points? No, we don't get any extra points. <laughs> Jax, you are correct, and you now have 30 points. Now our next round, contestants, you are going to be writing your answers on the white board in front of you. Here we go. How many pounds of plastic film does it take to make a bench? Do, 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 do. Answer, please. Hold up your boards. 
I said 867 5309. 500. 500 is correct. Jax, you now have 40 points. All right, next question. What should you do before you bring the plastic for recycling? Do, 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 do. All right, please show the board. I just said, come as you are. Clean and dry it. Correct, Jax, you have 40. Plus 10, making 50 points. All right, next question. How many pounds of plastic film has Aldersgate turned in since the beginning, November 15th? Answers. Well, plastic doesn't weigh that much, so I said 3.14. Mmm, high. 292. Jax. You are correct, and you now have a total of 60 points. And Scott, you have zero. So this is the final question. It is the bonus question, and winner will take all, but it's in two parts, so listen carefully. First part, how many pounds do we still need to recycle to our goal of 500 pounds? 208 pounds. Oh, I answered too soon. Sorry. Let me now tell you the second part. <laughs> what do we get if we can recycle 500 pounds of plastic film? Now. 208 pounds and an outdoor pick park bench. Pick park. 91.9 already a station and a new car. Scott, you have taken it all. Oh, you are the winner. Since I win, can I take all these bags down to the recycle station? You betcha. And friends, that ends our show. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. You heard it here, Aldersgate. We have already collected 292 pounds of plastic film. That means we only need 208 pounds to reach our goal of getting a bench. Keep recycling those number twos and fours, soft plastic film, as long as it stretches and you bring it clean and dry.